Five is the Finkbine lot. 43 is the Kinnick lot. There is a transcript today. Please speak up so the transcriber can hear your questions. After we're done with this press conference, to get to the floor, everyone's going to have to utilize the elevator. So all the seats are kind of pushed back. So I might have to take a couple turns going up and down the elevator, but I appreciate your cooperation with that. With that, we'll go right into questions for Coach. Fran, now that uh, Robrach has had a year in your system, how do you think he will be more productive? Rick, he's been great all summer, all fall. Uh, energy level, confidence level, every aspect of the game. Uh, you know, I've said this before, he has he has way more offense in his game than we saw last year. It was good at times, and it was pretty good in general. But I think you'll see a more aggressive offensive player. But defensively, uh, he's spectacular. I mean, guarding ball screens, close and recover, guarding smaller people. Uh, he's all over the glass. His energy level is great. He's in great shape physically. He's mature, he's been around, he's playing with a great deal of confidence right now. Fran, what's been the difference for Connor to actually have a full off -season, healthy offseason dedicated to basketball only? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's been a dramatic difference for him. Uh, you know, he'd still be playing baseball now. Uh, so all summer long, all fall, he's, he's been on the court. So he's in he's in more basketball shape. Uh, so that helps, especially when you're playing more than one position. But I think from a strictly a basketball standpoint, uh, he's been way more aggressive offensively, shooting the ball really well, which is understandable. When you're playing more, you're more comfortable, you know. And certainly he's he's been around, so he knows what we need. He knows what he's capable of. And he's he's been playing primarily with the younger guys, and so he's been doing a really good job with the leadership aspect with them. Uh, While well, at the same time, he feels a need to be more productive offensively, so he has been. So that's been good to see. As, as, a, as a coach, to have another coach on the floor, I know it's an old saying, but. He is so valuable, it seems, to your team because he knows the system, but he just has a, a feel, nuance about him. He does, and, and, and he's able to communicate that. He has the respect of the guys in the locker room. He says the right things at the right time. Uh, but he, he just thinks the game at a whole other level and in so many different ways, like anticipating what teams are going to do to us, especially in the league. You know, As you know, I mean, you seen it. Michigan State plays different than Indiana, plays different than Wisconsin. He knows what we're going to see from all those different teams, from those different coaches. And having him out there, we always talk about there's a difference between talking and communication. So when somebody's out there on the floor, you want chirping out there, right? You want guys talking, but you got to be saying the right things. It's got to be valuable information that's being translated from one person to another, not just making noise so it looks like you're playing hard. That doesn't do anybody any good. You've got to communicate, and that's what he does. And it's, it's, it's all day, every day. And we have some younger guys that are really good, and, and that type of uh, information on a regular basis really makes a difference. And it, it shortens the, the learning curve for those guys. Brian, what have you seen from Chris with his increased role this year? You know, he's, he's playing with a lot of confidence. I think, you know, what he did last spring was really good for him. You know, when he went to the Damian Lillard camp and, and had a chance to play with those guys. So and he's a very... Uh, even-tempered guy, but uh, he's also really smart, so he knows what he's capable of, and he knows what our team needs from him. So he he's accepting that responsibility. Uh, he's been way more aggressive offensively. Not that he wasn't last year, he certainly was. But I think, you know, defensively, 
he's always in the right place. You know, last year he was late sometimes, getting in foul trouble, limit his minutes. He hasn't been doing that. He's been really aggressive on the glass because we certainly need that. Without, you know, without Keegan, you know, we even go back to his freshman year. You know, without without Luca, like we we need we need he and Philip to to really, you know, pound the glass. In what ways do you expect Philip to take another step forward, and and do you feel like uh, thrown in that role in the next in the five? Yeah, I think you know. Philip is just he's just going to be a more confident guy and he's going to be more aggressive offensively. Uh, and I also think his minutes you know, will be great. I mean, he, he played a lot of minutes last year. He was a starter for us. But he's going to be out there a lot. We need him out there. Patrick really came on last year offensively especially. What have you seen as that continued? Yeah, you know, Patrick was, uh, you know, we, we were – Tinkering with where where to get him weight wise, we we kind of wanted him to get him up to two eleven, two twelve, two thirteen, and he was. He didn't like playing at that weight as much, and he, you know he's now at two o five, two o six. He's more comfortable in that range. Uh, but I think you'll see a guy that, from a confident standpoint, shooting the ball from three, but also when to play off two feet, when to play off one foot. You know, I think for him. When he would rip and drive, he was pretty much committed to going off one foot. And, and a lot of times that's good. Sometimes it wasn't. But when you get the defender on the side of you, get to the front of the rim, and you jump stop, because he's a really good passer and he's not a turnover guy, so you can create from there because everybody's turning facing the ball. And then you can also make a post move and utilize your footwork. So when you're 6'9 and you're at the front of the rim, you know now you can – Shot fake, step through, shoot your turn around, jump or shoot a jump hook, shot fake, go right up, uh, and then next time come down and go off one leg and dunk it or shoot a shoot a long finger roll. So I think for him, you, you, you're going to see a, a guy that's I think more complete offensively. With Peyton Sanford, you know, obviously growing another inch, uh, you got the potential to have four guys on the floor: Peyton, Patrick. Chris and Philip, I believe, can put six eight across the board. Do you see that as a as a feasible? Yeah, those guys are on the floor a lot, you know, and I like that about our team, Chad. You know, but you could also see, you know, Aaron, Tony, and and Desante on the floor going smaller, so we have some flexibility there. Uh, and then, then you you know you throw Connor and Josh Dix in there, and, you know, two six five guys that are tough that can play more than one position and you know both can shoot the ball so and we've got a lot of different ways we can go with this team and that's primarily going to be you know where where we're headed you know we got to get Josh and Riley ready you know and uh, those guys have made some progress as well how do you see the point guard situation uh, in terms of Who's going to play it and how much, or is it just too soon to even know that? I think it's pretty soon. I mean, Aaron Eulis has been really good. Uh, DeSante has been really good. I put Tony there some. Uh, and we, we, you know, but then, you know, put Peyton at the two spot, and we can go that route if we want to. Connor can play it. So we have a number of different options there uh, that I'm very comfortable with. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've been really impressed with, with Aaron Eulis's professionalism and his mental approach from the end of last year till now. And I think it's what you would have expected from a junior who has played a decent amount. He tailed off at the end of the year, not wasn't his fault because his, his, I told you guys before, he... His wrist was really bothering him, so he was having trouble finishing, having trouble shooting the ball, coming down to stretch. So he didn't play as much, uh, but uh, feels good now. You know, Desante is not playing like a freshman. He's very aggressive. He makes some freshman mistakes once in a while, but he can really get to the rim and create, and he can score. 
Uh, so when he puts it on the deck, he goes to score. So we got a lot of different guys who can score the basketball, and that's always a good thing. When did you cross the confidence line with Tony Perkins? Because he played some really good basketball for you down the stretch. And, and what about this year? Where's he going to go from? Well, I think the first step for him was his freshman year when we had some injuries and we put him in there and he produced. Uh, young kid, just on the road, produced. Uh, had a really good summer. Was playing well. And... Uh, you know, so we we made the decision to put Jabo back at the point, uh, and I think that was clearly what's best for him. It was best for our team, and, and I felt like you know, in that sense, you know, we're going to slide you know Tony into that two spot, and he was absolutely terrific. Uh, you know, I think he he understood that you know we needed to make that change, and he needed to be a guy that was involved in stepping up and help and take our team to the next level, which is exactly what he did. Frank, how important is about players? Is Tony one of the toughest? And how important is to have that toughness on the court as much as possible? You know, I like to think that that's, you know, going to be a staple of our program. You know, we're going to be tough. He certainly fits that mold. You look at the guys that have played for us over the years. You know, if you're going to win in this league, you better have that mindset. He's absolutely fearless. He was like that in high school. And, uh, I mean, he he had as good a high school senior year as, as anybody I've ever recruited. You know, nobody saw it, you know, because it was, you know, all, all that was going on. Uh, but uh, that kid's a gamer. And, you know, go to war with him any day. How important is it to get something from the post, your two post players this year, at least one? Well, it's going to be really important against certain teams. Uh, it won't be as important against other teams. But as you know, Pat, I mean, you, know, you, you look around our league, <clears throat> there's some pretty imposing five men. Not only in terms of talent, but, but physical size. You, know, you look at you know, Edie and Dickinson. You know, in particular, those guys, Cliff. Uh, you know, there's just a number of guys that are that are a handful. Uh, I thought Josh last year, when we we needed him to step up in those situations, produced well. Whether it was against Kofi, whether it was against Edie, uh, he was good. You know, Riley's got to get there. In the past, uh, Fran, you've gone through your all Big Ten caliber player on the court, and then they've left, and then you kind of shifted to whoever else is the next one, whether it's from Utah to White to Jock to, you know, the last few years, Garza and, and now Keegan. How, uh, who kind of makes that transition? Is it still, is it kind of organic right now as who might elevate, or do you see a person kind of taking that step forward for what Keegan Murray brought? I think it could be a number of different guys. Uh, you know, I think Chris, Patrick, Tony, Will probably be the first three to come to mind, but uh, you know it's not 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 just those three. In terms of all league, uh, you know those three would would jump to the front. You uh, put out a letter for us with the accomplishments of the last five seasons. Do you feel like uh, your program is as perhaps as good as it's ever been right now and uh, poised to continue to arc upward? Well, I, you know, I think, I think that is the, uh, you know, that was the plan, you know, when I came here, when, when you know, Mr. Barta hired me, that, that's what we hoped would happen. And I think you've seen a shift with how some coaches are doing it. You know, they're building a team one year to another. You know, I don't view myself as an AAU coach. I view myself as somebody who's going to try to continue to build a program. So my hope is to continue along that path of success and continue to get better. I think this team is very capable of doing exactly that. But then the challenge will be to do it next year and the year after that and the year after that. What strengths of your team in the past have been uh, how many players you've played and then being selfless? Do you see that from this group? Yeah, we, we, we wouldn't settle for anything less than that. You know, I don't think you, you would ever watch our teams and say, boy, that guy was selfish. At the same time, everybody is completely confident in taking a shot at any given time. There might be some times where you would say, 
boy, maybe they should have milked the clock a little bit more. And, you know, Peter, Peter Jock stepped up and pulled from three. Peyton Sanford pulled up from 26 feet. Bohannon, how many times did we see him do that? You know, so I, you know, my, I look at myself as my primary responsibility is to get our guys to play with supreme confidence. Uh, that's the only way they'll ever be the best version of themselves. I say that all the time. So you also have to know that your teammates put winning above anything else, and that's where the unselfishness comes in. We're going to move and share the ball. We're, and we're going to push it and sometimes shoot it quick. Uh, we're always in attack mode, and, and that takes a certain level of intelligence to know, okay, yeah, we want to play fast. Yeah, we want to attack, but we don't want to drive into packs of people and cough it up because live ball turnovers typically lead to layups at the other end. So, you know, you look at last year's team, you know, we're, our offensive productivity was really good, but we also led this, the nation in assist turnover ratio. So I think that's indicative of, of the character that we have in this program. Fran, I think you look at the versatility and experience combination kind of leaps off the page. Um, I, I guess just with the style of, that you guys like to play, I mean, how much is that, I guess, does it help to have that sort of versatility on this roster, and how would you compare it to maybe some of the other rosters you've had in the past? You know, I think you have to have it. Uh, you know, I think you always worry in this league, going back to one of the previous questions, you know, do you have enough rebounding? You know, everybody wants to play small these days. Uh, it's okay to play small because why? Because you're going to shoot a lot of threes, you're going to drive the ball. But can you rebound effectively night in and night out? That's the challenge. So, I mean, Peyton Sanford's a really good rebounder. Tony Perkins is a really good rebounder. Connor McCaffrey's a really good rebounder. Uh, Philip Robrats is a really good rebounder. Chris. So, you know, Patrick is solid. He's got to get a little bit better, and he has been. He's really focused on that. So if you're going to play smaller and go with that versatility that you're referring to, all right, we can't just all be dribble, draw, and kick and shoot threes. Somebody's got to rebound the ball. Sometimes you've got to go back and get it. And you've got to limit the other team to one shot if you want to run the fast break. You know, we can, I say this all the time, we can run on makes, but we prefer to run on misses. Have you seen, or do you think you'll see, uh, tangible positives from Keegan Murray and the impact that he potentially could make in the NBA? Yeah, uh, I would say, Mike, uh, very definitely. A uh, little different now because there's more factors involved in the recruiting process. Uh, but I think a lot of people look at Keegan and say, wait a minute, like, you know, his high school ranking was 347. And he was the fourth pick in the draft. He came into a system where he was allowed to showcase his entire skill set and, and develop confidence in a system that was successful. Uh, so that's always going to, you know, pay dividends on the recruiting trip. Young prospects, especially anybody you know in the six seven or six nine range, is going to be excited about that. We'll talk about the challenges that Chris will face this year. First time not playing with his brother, and then the inevitable comparisons to his brother, and maybe some of the challenges he'll face in the court because of that. Yeah, you know, I'm hoping that I, I think that's a very fair question. I I, I would hope that. People would just judge, judge, you know, we're watching Chris. You know, Chris is playing for us. We're all Kings fans. We love Keegan and hope he's a rookie of the year. So proud of him. He's MVP of the Summer League. A leading scorer in a game the other night, you know, his first game. So, I mean, we just couldn't be happier for him. But he's not here. Chris is here. And it's Chris's turn. And I think it'll be great for him. I mean, he'll miss his brother. Those guys are incredibly close. But uh, we need him to do uh, a lot of different things for this basketball team to be successful. And he's going to have that opportunity. He's on a big stage. He can, he can get it off the glass and push it himself. He can shoot threes when he wants. He can post up when he wants. Uh, he's going to be out there most of the time, unless he's in foul trouble. 
And he's like I said, he's been really good with that defensively. I've, I've been really impressed with him being in the right place. So, uh, you know, I'm excited for him. I think he's excited for it as well. Defensively, your team made strides last year. Defensively, do you think they can take it up another step this year? I think we can. I mean, we have the, the ability to do that. We can put pressure on the ball. We could be in the passing lane. Uh, again, I think when you start looking at, at defensive numbers, it comes down to rebounding. Because if, if you're giving up second shots, typically that's a high percentage shot. It's a po it's an offensive rebound kick out open three. It's an offensive rebound put back. That's you know a, a high percentage shot. So the shooting percentages against your team and effectiveness in terms of point production are going to go down. But if you limit them to one, then we put pressure on the ball. We can get our defense back. We can get everybody underneath the ball and communicate. Switching, not switching, how we're playing ball screens, all that stuff is great. But you got to get the rebound. What have you seen out of Josh Dix so far? Well, I'm really impressed with him. I mean, the kid, I mean, we all saw how, how horrific an injury he had. Uh, and how many people come back that quickly? You know, he was really smart and diligent with his rehab. He didn't rush it. It was really hard for him. In the nine weeks we had him here in June and July, that he didn't get the chance to get. I mean, he was on the court, but he was just doing one on one, one on zero stuff, really. Uh, and about September 1, he started going five on five, and he hasn't missed one minute of practice since. Uh, he's had some great days of practice where he's been absolutely spectacular. And there's been some days when he's clearly learning, but physically he looks really good. Fran, when you look at uh, recruiting, NIL has the potential to probably reshape men's basketball more than any other sport. Have, have you noticed challenges in this, uh, in that arena? And, and if so, what are the... What are the what well, I think the challenge is... I mean, I, I think everybody in this room knows what the challenges are. Okay, because it's pay for play. That's not what it was supposed to be. Uh, I've been adamant, adamant about the transfer portal rule is a bad rule, uh, especially in conjunction with NIL, because that's what become that's where the pay for play comes in. There's nothing wrong with the rule before. It was not a penalty. Uh, I've said that before. I mean, I'm an example of it. I transferred. You transfer, you don't lose any eligibility. You get a year of lifting, you get another year of, of uh, an opportunity to, to be a student, a double major, start a master's, you're in school for an extra year. There's, there's no negative there. But to declare every college basketball player a free agent is foolish. And that's what they've done. Coach, we're here about new guardrails for this transfer portal in NIL. Do you know anything that's going to come down? No, I do not. Uh, I don't see any. I hope you're right. I don't see them. Uh, a lot of college basketball at the top, top players are five star freshmen or transfers. Bouncing off of Scott's question, plenty of good programs like yours use developmental uh, or have developmental players. Not that one is right or one is wrong, but what do you feel is the difference with a program like yours it has the developmental programs most uh, players? Well, I, you know, my hope is that when you recruit somebody, and, and you know, not everybody is great the first minute they get here. I mean, it, it was never that expectation, right? I mean, when I first got into this, you're supposed to be pretty good and then get better. You look at Luca; he was pretty good his freshman year. He averaged, I think, just under 12 points a game. And next, you know, it's not like anybody thought, "Boy, this guy is definitely going to be the national player of the year a couple of years from now." But he was because he kept working. Uh, you know, you put him in a system and, and you watch film with them and you help them in the weight room and you do skill development with them. And that's, that's what culture is and that's what building a program is and that's what we've continued to try to do. Uh, and I think if you, if you do it that way and you treat your guys the right way, they'll be less likely to leave. We've had some guys leave. But it hasn't been mass exodus like it's been in some places. Uh, you know, I think our department 
our coaching staff, you know, we really are cognizant of making this a, a tremendous experience for our, for our players across the board, whether it be academic support, how we feed them, how we travel, and giving them every opportunity to be successful. Uh, but if you, if you coach them up right and you're, and you're honest and transparent, uh, I think most of the kids that we bring in are, you know, I always said the first thing that I look at in recruiting is character. So if you recruit character guys, then, then they'll behave the right way. Uh, but there is an expectation uh, that there's a lot of money out there. And, hey, it's nothing personal, but I can get X number of dollars somewhere else. You know, those days have come for certain players and certain programs. Uh, and it's not even like their prospects are, are demanding it, but they somewhat are expecting it. And then all of a sudden it's offered, okay, you know, I'll, I'll jump on it. So, uh, you know, I think we have to continue to work hard in being competitive in the NIL market, which we have been. I've been very active myself uh, in that arena. It's all new for every one of us. But, uh, you know, I want my guys to know that I'm out there fighting for them to help them, you know, be in a position to to profit from what is, I think, a really good rule, the NIL, so that our guys do profit from their name, image, and likeness. Uh, and I've said this before publicly, and I'll say it again today. You know, I'm not going to give a bunch of money to a high school kid that I'm not giving to one of the guys that's already played for me. I'm not going to do that. Uh, that could be foolish over the long haul. Maybe we'll lose a guy or two. Maybe, you know, but if we get to the point where we're paying our guys a substantial amount of money, then we can offer the same money to that other guy. Okay, we'll do it then. But, uh, you know, and that's happened this spring and summer uh, to guys that we were recruiting. So that's the world we live in. Uh, things change. I mean, a lot of you guys have been doing what you're doing just like me for a long time. But a lot of changes over the course of, of the time that I've been coaching. Uh, a lot of them are really good. Some of them maybe not as good. But, uh, you know, let's be honest. You know, we just signed a $7 billion TV deal. Okay? And, and the NCAA tournament was a multi-billion dollar TV deal before that. So it was inevitable that the players should share in, in some of that revenue. Okay, thank you, Coach. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you down on the floor. Go Phillies. <laughs> Thank you.